Today, 150,000 farmers in India have committed suicide in areas where seed has been destroyed. They have to buy these seeds from Monsanto at very high costs, and this high-cost seed is pushing them into debt, leading them to suicide. What we've done is create community seed banks, places where we collect and save seeds, rescue them from disappearance, multiply them, and then distribute them according to farmers' needs. About 40 community seed banks have been created across the length and breadth of India. In places where these have been created, farmers are not in distress because the biggest cost today is seeds and chemicals. These seed banks are now being a new place where we can respond to the new crisis of globalization on the one hand and climate change on the other. Globalization has led to farmer suicides. We are able to take seeds to the suicide zones and distribute these seeds so that farmers can bring out of that dependency, grow food crops, get out of debt. We've been able to create community seed banks to deal with climate change. For the extreme flooding, the new and roots, the cyclones, the hurricanes that lead to salinization. And today for us, the work on seed has become the place from where we are responding to the worst tragedies and the worst crisis of our times. So, the way a mother rat takes care of its pups is by licking and grooming, nipple switching, arching back, and nursing. So, there are rats that do a lot of licking and grooming, and there are last rats that groom very little. But most rats are in between. So, that resembles a human behavior as well, right? You have mothers that are highly mothering and mothers that couldn't care less, and most mothers are somewhere in between. So, if you look at these rats, so all you do, you observe them and put them in separate cages. So, you put the high lickers in one cage, not the mothers, but the offspring, and the low lickers in another cage. And then you let them grow, and they're adults now, their mothers are long buried, and you look in the brain. And you see that those who had high licking mothers express a lot of glucocorticoid receptor gene, and those lawmakers express, you know, that reflects a number of factors and that results in a different stress response. But this is not the only difference. We found later on there are hundreds of genes that are differently expressed. So, if you get in a mutation, you know, polymorphism once in a million. Here, just the motherly launching just hundreds of genes in one shot, and it changes them in a very stable way that you can look at the old rat. And you can say whether it was licked or not but you can also say by behavior. So, if you walk to the cages to the room, the rats that were poorly lit are highly anxious, hard to handle, aggressive, and, and the rats that were very well handled as as of as little pups. They are much more relaxed, much easier to handle. So, you know, like every technician in the lab knows, looking at the adult rat, how it was licked when it was a little, tough any question, of course, mechanism, how does this work? People appear to be born to compute. 
The numerical skills of children develop so early and so inexorably that it is easy to imagine an internal clock of mathematical maturity guiding their growth. Not long after learning to walk and talk, they can set the table with impressive accuracy one knife, one spoon, one fork, for each of the five chairs. Soon, they are capable of noting that they have placed five knives, spoons, and forks on the table and, a bit later, that this amounts to fifteen pieces of silverware. Having thus mastered addition, they move on to subtraction. It seems almost reasonable to expect that if a child were secluded on a desert island at birth and retrieved seven years later, he or she could enter a second-grade mathematics class without any serious problems of intellectual adjustment. Of course, the truth is not so simple. This century, the work of cognitive psychologists has illuminated the subtle forms of daily learning on which intellectual progress depends. Children were observed as they slowly grasped or, as the case might be, bumped into concepts that adults take for granted. Quantity is unchanged as water pours from a short glass into a tall thin one. Psychologists have since demonstrated that young children, asked to count the pencils in a pile, readily report the number of blue or red pencils, but must be coaxed into finding the total. Such studies have suggested that the rudiments of mathematics are mastered gradually and with effort. They have also suggested that the very concept of abstract numbers, the idea of oneness, twoness, Threeness that applies to any class of objects and is a prerequisite for doing anything more mathematically demanding than setting a table is itself far from innate. If your recruiting efforts attract job applicants with too much experience and near certainty in this weak labor market, you should consider a response that runs counter to most hiring managers' MO, don't reject those applicants out of hand. Instead, take a closer look. New research shows that overqualified workers tend to perform better than other employees, and they don't quit any sooner. Furthermore, a simple managerial tactic empowerment can mitigate any dissatisfaction they may feel. The prejudice against too good employees is pervasive. Companies tend to prefer an applicant who is a perfect fit over someone who brings more intelligence, education, or experience than needed. On the surface, this bias makes sense, 
studies have consistently shown that employees who consider themselves overqualified exhibit higher levels of discontent. For example, overqualification correlated well with job dissatisfaction in a 2008 study of 156 call center representatives by Israeli researchers Saul Fine and Baruch Nevo. And unlike discrimination based on age or gender, declining to hire overqualified workers is perfectly legal. But even before the economic downturn, a surplus of overqualified candidates was a global problem, particularly in developing economies, where rising education levels are giving workers more skills than are needed to supply the growing service sectors. If managers can get beyond the conventional wisdom, the growing pool of two good applicants is a great opportunity. Baron Erdogan and Talia N. Bauer of Portland State University in Oregon found that overqualified workers' feelings of dissatisfaction can be dissipated by giving them autonomy in decision-making. At stores where employees didn't feel empowered, overeducated workers expressed greater dissatisfaction than their colleagues did and were more likely to state an intention to quit. But that difference vanished where self-reported autonomy was high. Computer scientist Shwetak Patel and his team are developing new sensing systems. The initial focus was really around energy and water monitoring. They built a new generation of smart sensors that monitor electronic interference on a home's power line or water pressure changes in the plumbing. Most of this technology has already found industrial applications. And Patel and his team turned their attention to adapting the technology for personal health monitoring. So how do we take this noise and make it into a signal? It was hard to us, hard to us in the core of what we did for many years, and we're taking that work and applying it to other domains. They're looking to take advantage of all the functionality built into our smartphones. With the user's permission, this app can use the microphone built into most smartphones to listen to background noises, such as coughing, searching for patterns that suggest a trip to the doctor might be in order. We've constructed these models that try and understand how sound works, how its patterns are, and we give it a whole bunch of examples of different kinds of audio, things like people talking, things like people laughing, sneezing, and of course, coughing. 
This app uses a phone's camera to check hemoglobin levels in blood by analyzing the color of capillary fluid through the skin. Generally, what happens is if you're anemic, your blood may be a little less red. And we take advantage of that by putting your finger over a camera of a phone. The camera of the phone can actually see the coloration of the blood. And this test uses the camera to tell parents worried about jaundice in newborn infants. Now, jaundice is something that doctors who have seen tons of babies, he just can figure out on a very basic level of it. Is this baby, do they need to get treatment or are they in a good condition? While the first-time parent has no idea necessarily what jaundice might look like. The researchers say the built-in sensors found in smartphones are already commonplace, but their applications and their implications for our health and well-being may be more far-reaching than we ever imagined. The brain is basically built from the bottom up. First, the brain builds basic circuits that are responsible for basic skills, and then more complex circuits are built on top of those basic circuits as we develop more complex skills. Biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry, it's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in a reciprocal relationship, the relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that, we mean what we refer to as the serve and return nature of children's interaction with their adult caregivers. And the impact of experience on development is not a one-way street. It's a back-and-forth interaction. The brain is a highly integrated organ which has multiple sections that specialize in different kinds of processes. So, we have parts of the brain that are involved more in cognitive function, and other parts that are involved in the processing of emotion, and parts involved in seeing and hearing. So if a child is emotionally well-regulated and socially competent, that will affect more positive and productive learning. And if a child is preoccupied with fears or anxiety or is dealing with considerable stress, no matter how intellectually gifted that child might be, his or her learning is going to be impaired by that kind of emotional interference.
I'm 43 years old, and I owe tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. Oh sure, I knew the loans were piling up as I went through school. But with one loan coming from here, another from there, I had no idea of the rock slide that was building. Fifteen years later. I still experience moments of sheer horror regarding my family's financial situation. My monthly student loan payment is more than triple my car payment. Okay, so without my college degree, I would not have been able to get my current job. For that, I'm grateful, but at what cost? My loans have been accruing at a rate of 10%, and now they have burgeoned to, well, I'm an English major, you do the math. I don't think they'll ever get paid off. We're in debt way past our eyeballs, and there's no hope in sight. I'm being kept in class. A financial class of graduates whose only hope for attending college meant borrowing money from the government. Because of our mounting credit card debt and monthly payments that far exceed our family's income. My kids will also join the class of citizens who can rely on their parents for college support. Do I wish I'd chosen another educational route? You bet. Wind turbine is a device that will convert wind into mechanical movement, which we can use to power a water pump or electricity generator. Now, the power that the turbine creates is obviously dependent on the wind speed. It also depends on the number of sails, the area of the sails, and the angle of the sails in relation to the wind. So, you can imagine if the turbine blades are flat onto the wind, the wind's going to just bend it. If there's a slight angle, when the wind hits it, it's going to turn the blades. We can use that for powering things. Now. We're going to have a go, making some of the very, very simple paper windmills, a sort of things that you can make from the bits and pieces lying around home, and use that to drive a very small generator to power electronic devices. This simulation shows what you might see if you are orbiting a black hole. The light and position of background stars around the hole are distorted by its gravity, and they seem to spin around. On the right, the constellation Orion appears to approach the event horizon, the boundary from which nothing can escape. Orion stars look like they become separated and get spun around. Once the hole has passed by, Orion reappears on the left and looks normal again. Users can also experiment with different scenarios. This is what you might see if you were traveling towards a black hole with rocket engines slowing your descent. Another simulation mimics freefall into a hole. In the middle, the light of the entire universe appears to be concentrated in a bright ring.
The illustration often used is the one with monkeys and typewriters. The concept behind it is that if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life. Don't worry about it, yes, it's strange, yes, it's wonderful. But leave enough matter 600 million years on earth and you will have life. So, the monkey sitting at the typewriter, the chances are eventually he produces the complete works of Shakespeare, so what's the problem? So, there's no problem. There's no issue, right? You just leave it long enough and you'll find. And one keystroke per second, the monkey might well eventually get to you the complete works of Shakespeare, but he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So, what I decided to do is run the numbers. Instead of saying typing the complete works of Shakespeare, I just run the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing one keystroke a second. To type to be or not to be, that is the question. Right? On average, how long is it gonna take my monkey friend, one keystroke a second? I don't know how you think it would be. Maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth isn't supposed to have emerged within? And when I run the numbers, to be or not to be? That is the question, takes 12.6 trillion 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 years to type just that phrase, and a DNA string has got as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. Are we saying that something of that complexity emerges by chance, undirected, within 600 million years? Again. It's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have that it tilts me in favor of the Christian story in which God creating life, simply a question of saying, let that be and there was. But in the face of the sense of disempowerment, there is surprisingly no decline in involvement in organizations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, protect one another's rights, and work towards the common good. According to the United Nations, civil society groups have grown 40 fold since the turn of the last century. Internationally, the nonprofit sector is worth $1 trillion, and there are 700,000 such organizations in Australia alone. The UN recognizes 37,000 specifically civil society organizations across the globe and gave 3,500 accreditations to the 2002 World Summit on Sustainable Development. This profound movement towards harnessing voices and resources from outside the realm of governments and officialdom reflects a profound growth in NGOs, the third sector as some call it. Putnam discovered in the field of local government in Italy. The best predictor of governmental success was the strength and density of a region's civic associations. Well, it's about whether you can achieve a win-win solution, whether you can achieve economic growth which brings wealth in order to cut poverty without damaging the biodiversity. And the argument is that if you want to protect biodiversity, you have to focus on that as a goal. But if you do that, 
you run the risk of hurting the poor and you also run the risk of inconveniencing and reducing the economic growth. We use the developed and industrialized countries to see this argument, this axis argued about with, let us say, a government wishing to start drilling for oil in place X, which is full of wildlife, and Wildlife Conservation Society is urging them not to on the grounds that it's a wilderness refuge. We used to that debate. What I'm saying is that in the developing world there's a third axis, and it's a complex one. For better or worse, we live in a world profoundly affected by Sigmund Freud. If I had to ask you to name a famous psychologist, the answer of most of you would be Freud. He was the most famous psychologist ever and he had a profound influence on the 20th and 21st century. Some biographical information, he was born in the 1850s. He spent most of his life in Vienna, Austria, but he died in London. He escaped to London soon after retreating there at the beginning of World War II as the Nazis began to occupy where he lived. He was one of the most famous scholars ever, but he was not known for any single discovery. Instead, he was known for the development of an encompassing theory of mind, one that he developed over the span of many decades. He was in his time extremely well known. A celebrity recognized on the street and throughout his life. He was a man of extraordinary energy and productivity, in part because he was a very serious cocaine addict, but also just in general. He was just a high-energy sort of person. Indeed, the library. We've all been to a historic library. We've all enjoyed the smell of a historic library. But what is it? And what does it mean? When we've recently, when at UCL Center for Sustainable Heritage, we've recently been asked to assess the environment at another historic library at St. Paul's Cathedral, the Wren Library, an incredible place. And it has such an intensive smell of old books and we were also asked, for the first time, really, I was actually taken aback by the brief. We were asked what to do, please preserve the smell. It is so important to our audience. It is so important how people perceive the library. So, that is, that was quite an important message in our research. And indeed the smell is an important way of how we communicate with the environment. This piece of research was done by an advertising company because advertisers are so interested in how we, how we interact with each other and the environment. And we see that the majority of people use sight. Obviously, to interact with the environment, but on the second place, we see the smell is also very, very important.
The skug is a new university accessible musical instrument. It is designed to be used by children or adults with special needs, or in fact, be used by anyone. It's soft, it's easy to play, it's robust, and it can be customized to suit anyone's abilities. The skug helps students with special needs by allowing them to get involved in making music themselves. It's an instrument that they can play and they can take ownership of and start creating their own sounds and music. Traditional instruments are the shape and size and made of the materials they are because of the sound that they need to make. If you want to make a sound like a plucked string, you need a string and it needs to be under tension, whereas with a skug, because it's a mixture of software and a sensor, then thus the computer can handle making the sound. And so we can design an object that's designed to be touched and designed to be played with. In developing the skug and working with kids in the schools and in the classrooms, it's really helped us make the skug something that's usable by the children themselves. They've informed us massively on how it needs to work and they've given their opinions on colors and designs. And just the feedback they've given us has been just marvelous. It's just so enriching and it's really inspiring to actually work with these kids particularly when you can provide them with an ability to start playing their own music as opposed to just taking part through listening and listening to other musicians and really learning from. When this dog approaches some food, another dog's playful snarls are played back. The dog seems curious, but the sound doesn't stop it from taking the bone. Here, a dog hears the growls of a dog being approached by a stranger, but these don't deter it from grabbing the bone either. In another scenario, the sound of a dog protecting its food is played back. This time, the dog backs off. These experiments suggest that dogs can distinguish between different types of growls.
I want to explore certain issues with you. There is no conclusion to my top, there is no closure. I think over time throughout history, cities have changed in whether they were strategic spaces or routinized spaces. This, our global modernity, is the time when cities are strategic. That doesn't mean all cities, but that means that certain cities throughout the world become spaces where our most acute problems, our major government challenges hit the ground, become concrete, become urgent. The city. Urban space has a capacity to pull down a lot of stuff that otherwise stayed up there. Take the environmental question national states can talk and talk and talk for years. Kyoto took years but, in the meantime, cities had to deal with the environmental list. Tissue engineering, what is it? It's an emerging field, interdisciplinary field that combines engineering and life sciences to create functional biological structures that can restore and improve tissue function. Examples include bladders, trachea, blood vessels, and if you look at it. Printing as a technology has also gone through the revolution and well, it's been around for hundreds of years. In the last couple of decades, it's been a new dimension. We can now print layer by layer in materials ranging from plastic to metal, to concrete, to chocolate. From the smallest scales to the largest. If you take 3D printing and we combine it with biology, we have bioprinting where the building blocks are cell aggregates where we called bioink particles that are composed of thousands of cells that can fuse together into different shapes. These geometries can include multilayered sheets, such as skin, branching tubes for vasculature, and the sophistication of this manufacturing technology improves daily to include different cell types and different shapes. And now why is it important? The pharmaceutical industry at the moment is in a moment of crisis. It spends more money each year on R&D, but has fewer drugs to show for it. It takes more than a decade, more than a billion dollars, to develop a new drug and the cost of a failure can be measured in hundreds of millions of dollars. I've been asked to speak today about the purpose of museums, and I think that's something we often take for granted, that we have museums and we need museums. But with so much information available now online, people have access to whatever it is they want to know. So I think we need to consider carefully just what it is that we expect of our museums today. What makes them relevant in the information age?
Clearly, we've got to move beyond the early 20th century concept of a warehouse full of old, remarkable, untouchable objects. This warehouse idea does very little to inspire people. What museum professionals need to do what they should be doing is make their collections and programs work towards the purpose of education. So whether that means having more hands-on exhibits, becoming involved with other community organizations, they should be doing whatever it takes to think about their visitors, to engage people, to educate them. And in that way, they can be instruments of social change. I suppose more and more, people are starting to see graffiti as a form of art. Now there are still many who would beg to differ and they'd point to the destructive scribblings that we see on our bus shelters and our public buildings. These often take the form of tags, which are fancy. Scribble-like versions of someone's name or nickname. Tags generally have no aesthetic appeal and they are the scourge of the high street shopkeeper in many a town. I can certainly see where the shopkeepers and property owners are coming from. But the fact is, graffiti has been around for a very long time indeed. People left their mark on cave walls back in prehistoric times and it's been found too on ancient monuments in Egypt and Rome. But New York-style graffiti, which is really the forerunner of a lot of the graffiti that's getting done now, New York graffiti, took off in the late 1960s. That's when the advent of the spray can allow the humble tag to evolve into more complex styles. In the mid to late 70s, subway trains became the new forum for graffiti artists to display their skills. For many young people, it became a medium to express their disillusionment with a system from which they felt excluded. Now of course, the art establishment embraces graffiti artists and some of these artists have actually taken on cult status. Big plants are steady, but they're not very flexible. Generally, to power something, you have these huge baseload gas plants. And these are running kind of all the time no matter what, and they're pretty slow, and you can't really adjust how much energy they're creating. When demand is too low, these big slow plants actually lose money. And when demand is too high, quicker, dirtier plants, called peaker plants, have to switch on to keep up. And they're pretty wasteful. So you kind of get dinged on both sides. You get dinged when you don't have enough load and then when you have too much, 
you also get dinged in efficiently. So, traditional plants aren't super efficient, but they're consistent and therefore predictable. Renewable energy can be another story. Solar and wind power is cheap and clean and plentiful, but only when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. So, inconsistency is the big worry, that, you know, it'll be a cloudy day or it'll be a still day and then all of a sudden, your appliances won't work. And that's something that no one really wants. What makes batteries so promising is that they can solve all of these problems. When paired with big power plants, they can supply energy during peak times without polluting the way that peaker plants do. And when paired with renewables, they can jump in when clouds roll over a solar farm. Energy storage really is the missing piece of the puzzle for renewable energy. But when we say storage, we don't just necessarily mean these. On a super broad level, a battery is like a bank for energy. You deposit energy into it when you don't need it, and withdraw it when you do. We use electrical energy on the grid, but we can store it as any kind of energy. I was a complant pharmacist, I do consults, and I got into this, cause I really saw that in my own kids, but my own patients, they were missing the food part. They were missing that nutrition part. And as I corrected the nutrition in them, I'm like, oh my, this changed their whole life. You were taught in pharmacist school, just give her drug, give her drug, give her drug. Drugs are just band-aids. They don't cure us. If you don't have good nutrition, that foundation that we were building our body on isn't there, and so that leads to all sorts of things, you know. Depression, leaky gut, you know, your gum disease. People that are constantly having headaches when they are not growing properly. Our kids don't grow properly cause of nutrition. So starts to get foundation. If you have a good, good foundation with nutrition, eat it. What you grow or buy it locally, you gonna be way healthier. So crazy how your diet can affect pretty much everything. It's hard to put into a sentence how cool and interesting I thought this whole experience was. I've always been a firm believer and what you put in your body matters. And the food you put in your body matters. And we are allowing food industries to spray with pesticides, to transport it super far, change its enzymes and nutritional benefits, so that when we are receiving the food, it's not even giving us the fuel that we need to survive in a healthy way. The body is an incredible piece of equipment, machinery. You put good stuff in, it gets good stuff out. You put bad stuff in, in time, bad stuff will come out. But you can correct it. It just takes some, some effort on our part to do what's right. Who said that, Hippocrates, you are what you eat. Let food be medicine, let medicine be food. He said a lot more elegantly, but, yeah, I firmly believe that. When Daniel was 13 around 1994, he had recognized the potential of creating websites for the fledgling internet. 
so he started a small home business, making websites for clients. He charged his first client $100, but then charged the next client $200. The price was still below the industry average. So as demand for internet websites began to explode, soon Daniel could charge $5,000 per website. To help expand the business, Daniel recruited students from his computing class. He successfully bribed them with the promise of video games. His earnings would eventually reach $50,000 per month. And by age 18, he was managing a team of 25. His parents only noticed his earnings when he started bringing home those large TVs. As time progressed, the internet began to see the growth of downloading music illegally. Since then, the world has changed for the Goliaths of the record industry, Sony, Universal, and others. The record companies say they will lose billions in sales because fans are getting their music for free. And they want banning stopped. Observing the trend, Daniel realized something. Later in an interview, he states his realization. Quote, you can never legislate away piracy. Laws can definitely help, but it doesn't take away the problem. The only way to solve the problem was to create a service that's better than piracy and at the same time compensates the music industry. This idea was the basis for Spotify. There's evidence that caffeine's effects on adenosine and dopamine receptors can have long-term benefits, too, reducing the risk of diseases like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and some types of cancer. Caffeine can also ramp up the body's ability to burn fat. In fact, some sports organizations think that caffeine gives athletes an unfair advantage and have placed limits on its consumption. From 1972 until 2004, Olympic athletes had to stay below a certain blood caffeine concentration to compete. Of course, not all of caffeine's effects are so helpful. It might make you feel better and more alert, but it can also raise your heart rate and blood pressure, cause increased urination or diarrhea, and contribute to insomnia and anxiety. Plus, the foods and beverages caffeine is found in have their own impact on your body that have to be taken into account. Your brain can adapt to regular consumption of caffeine. If your adenosine receptors are perpetually clogged, your body will manufacture extra ones. That way, even with caffeine around, adenosine can still do its job of signaling the brain to power down. That's why you may find you need to consume more and more caffeine to feel alert. There are more and more adenosine receptors to block. Living on the moon won't be easy. The camp envisioned is not so much a village as an inhabited research base. Similar to those in places like Antarctica, but there are far greater obstacles to living on the moon than just cold weather. The biggest is cosmic radiation. Unlike the Earth, the moon has no atmosphere and no magnetic field. 
A person on its surface can receive over 400 times the maximum safe dosage of heavy ion radiation, enough to be fatal within 10 hours even in a spacesuit. The first step would likely involve robots and 3D printers constructing covered habitats from lunar soil or building shelters inside caves formed by lava tubes from the moon's volcanic past. But what would the inhabitants live on? Supplies would need to be transported from Earth at first. Growing plants requires greenhouses, soil, and air rich in carbon dioxide, a gas that's rare on the moon but could be synthesized from recycled materials. A water treatment plant could be supplied by ice mined from the polar regions using a specialized drill that can bore 2 meters beneath the lunar surface. Friendly bacteria and viruses necessary to the human microbiome and immune system would also have to be imported or synthesized on site. And lunar inhabitants would have to exercise for hours a day to maintain bone and muscle mass. That's because the moon's gravity is just one-sixth that of the Earth, and the everyday strain of working against gravity is part of what keeps our bodies healthy. First, gases always move in a straight line. We don't really have anything to demonstrate this with because gravity always pulls objects down. So imagine a bullet fired from a gun, and that bullet goes on at a constant speed in a perfectly straight line. That would be like a gas molecule. Second, gases are so small, they occupy no volume on their own. As a group, they do, blow up any balloon and you can see how that volume changes. But single gases have no volume compared to other forms of matter. Rather than calculating such a small amount of matter, we just call it zero for simplicity. Third, if gas molecules collide, and they do, remember, these are assumptions, their energy remains constant. An easy way to demonstrate this is by dropping a soccer ball with a tennis ball balanced on top. Because the soccer ball is bigger, it has more potential energy and the energy from the larger ball is transferred to the smaller tennis ball and it flies away when that energy is transferred. The total energy stays the same. Gases work the same way. If they collide, smaller particles will speed up. Larger particles will slow down. The total energy is constant. Fourth, gases do not attract one another, and they don't like to touch. But remember rule three. In reality, they do collide. Finally, gases have energy that is proportional to the temperature. The higher the temperature, the higher the energy the gases have. The crazy thing is that at the same temperature, all gases have the same energy. It doesn't depend on the type of gas, just the temperature that gas is at. and food insecurity could still not afford to eat or to buy what they should be eating. Why? Because America's food system is designed from the farm bill on up to make calories cheap and nutrition expensive. That's why the face of hunger in America today is an obese person. 
Food insecure Americans are forced to fill up on food that's loaded with sugar, fat, sodium, little nutrition. Hence the answer isn't a full stomach, it's a healthy meal. So my next learning was about money. Nonprofits tend to spend 75% of management's time in fundraising. They do great work. It's the air they breathe. But, funder fatigue sets in, funding dries up. So I wondered, instead of seeking donors to continually fund our mission, year after year, would it be possible to have a mission that could fund itself? Well, we did something interesting. We actually went into a food insecure neighborhood and asked the people what they wanted. And they said, we don't want handouts, we want to buy tasty, nutritious food we can afford. We're not looking for charity, we're buying food now, we want to keep buying food. Don't make your store needs based, everybody should be able to shop there. We don't want to feel stigmatized by shopping in a store that's just for poor people. Another light bulb turns out people are even hungrier to keep their dignity than for nutrition. Which means we can use the dignity problem to help solve the funding problem. So, my optimism is rooted in the fact that for almost over 200 years, every year has gotten a little bit better when we look at the scientific evidence. And while it's possible that, next year everything could change, that everything could collapse and fall to the ground, statistically, probabilistically it won't, it will continue, because 200 years has gone and next year it probably will continue. But if you look at the kind of current political regime around the world and the factors of pressures, environmental pressures, the pressures of distraction that we have from the new media, then I think you have to resort to hope. In the long term, optimists decide the future. It's the optimists who create all the things that are going to be most important in our lives, because it was optimists who built and invented all the things that are now important in our current lives. And I think people behave better when they're optimistic. There's absolutely a need to be critical and doubtful and skeptical and even pessimistic. Just like if you have a car, you have to have brakes. You can't have a car, no matter where it is, without brakes. But it's the engine. The optimistic engine that keeps going and going and refuses to stop and is only concerned about going forward that really drives a car. Most people intuitively blame it on their nerves, but why does being nervous undermine expert performance? There are two sets of theories, which both say that primarily choking under pressure boils down to focus. First, there are the distraction theories. These suggest that performance suffers when the mind is preoccupied with worries, doubts, or fears, instead of focusing its attention on performing the task at hand. When relevant and irrelevant thoughts compete for the same attention, something has to give. The brain can only process so much information at once. Tasks that challenge working memory, the mental scratch pad we use to temporarily store phone numbers and grocery lists, are especially vulnerable to pressure. 
In a 2004 study, a group of university students were asked to perform math problems, some easy, others more complex and memory intensive. Half the students completed both problem types with nothing at stake, while the others completed them when calm and under pressure. While everyone did well on the easy problems, those who were stressed performed worse on the more difficult, memory-intensive tasks. Explicit monitoring theories make up the second group of explanations for choking under pressure. They're concerned with how pressure can cause people to overanalyze the task at hand. Here, the logic goes that once a skill becomes automatic, thinking about its precise mechanics interferes with your ability to do it. Tasks we do unconsciously seem to be most vulnerable to this kind of choking. There are two major factors that cause food to go bad, microbes and oxidation. Microbes like bacteria and fungi invade food and feed off its nutrients. Some of these can cause diseases, like listeria and botulism. Others just turn edibles into a smelly, slimy, moldy mess. Meanwhile, Oxidation is a chemical change in the food's molecules caused by enzymes or free radicals which turn fats rancid and brown produce, like apples and potatoes. Preservatives can prevent both types of deterioration. Before the invention of artificial refrigeration, fungi and bacteria could run rampant in food. So we found ways to create an inhospitable environment for microbes. For example, making the food more acidic unravels enzymes that microbes need to survive. And some types of bacteria can actually help. For thousands of years, people preserved food using bacteria that produce lactic acid. The acid turns perishable vegetables and milk into longer-lasting foods, like sauerkraut in Europe, kimchi in Korea, and yogurt in the Middle East. These cultured foods also populate your digestive tract with beneficial microbes. Many synthetic preservatives are also acids. Benzoic acid in salad dressing, sorbic acid in cheese, and propionic acid in baked goods.